Welcome to the History of European Theatre podcast, and thanks for joining me on this journey through millennia of theatrical history. Episode 70, French Renaissance Theatre, Part 1, The Italian Influence. Last time, I described how the Renaissance playwrights struggled to get theatre out of the classroom, and how the church both promoted and held back theatre in the Germanic states. Through the 16th century and into the 17th, Germanic theatre continued to be something closer to medieval theatre, lacking many of the changes that Italian theatre promoted from the beginning of the period. Unlike the Germanics, the French had a closer proximity to the area at the heart of the Italian Renaissance, so we might think that the French Renaissance period was much more similar to the Italian experience. Well, once again, the answer is both yes and no. In many ways, French dramatists followed the Italian model – but they also found their own voice and created something distinctively French. But, as you're now used to hearing me say, this took some time to develop. Once again, we can sensibly start with the Italian influence, as the early Renaissance moved north and, in this case, those influences came from the top down. On the 28th of October, 1533, Catherine de' Medici married Henry, Duke of Orléans, the second son of King Francis I of France. It was a political marriage, and one where, even after some time, there was little love between the couple concerned. Catherine was no beauty, at best being described as plain and mannish, at worst as displaying the protruding eyes and broad features common in her family, and considered ugly at the time. She was, however, a highly intelligent and politically aware woman. Her mother was a French noblewoman, and her father the Duke of Urbino. But her mother died soon after she was born, and her father didn't last much longer. Through her childhood, she was bounced from one relative to another, depending on the politics of the time. She ended up in the care of Pope Clement VII, another Medici relation, just as she reached marriageable age. She had plenty of suitors from the very upper echelons of society, including kings and princes, thanks to the power and wealth her family commanded. When Clement received an offer for Catherine of the hand of Henry, the second son of Francis I, King of France, he accepted the offer with enthusiasm. As Catherine was a commoner, this was a significant elevation for her and by implication for the Medici family. The bankers and merchants had made it into the highest aristocratic family on the continent. When Catherine arrived in France for her wedding, she was 14 and brought with her troops of Italian singers, dancers and actors. Some of these performers remained attached to her court, but after the wedding ceremonies were complete, others moved into the city of Paris independently and introduced the French audience to the latest opera, ballet and other performing arts. After performing the required wedding night services, apparently in the presence of his father, who felt it necessary to ensure that the marriage has been consummated, Henry took little interest in his young wife, preferring the company of his many mistresses and the sport in the tilting yard, where he was accomplished at jousting. In 1536, Henry's older brother caught a chill while playing tennis and succumbed to a fever and died. Now that Henry was the heir to the throne and Catherine the future queen, all the pressure was on her to produce an heir. Henry had proved his potency with his various mistresses, but for ten years the royal couple produced no children. Whatever the problem was there, it was solved with the birth of their first child in 1544. Seven more children followed, but the marriage was always just a functional one, and Catherine and her husband were often remote from each other, and she had no political power divested to her in her own right. Consequently, she devoted much of her time and energies to promoting cultural life in her new homeland. France was in for turbulent times. Henry ascended the throne in 1547, but died in a jousting accident in 1559. An opponent's lance pierced his helmet and took out one of his eyes. He lingered for nine days before he died from the eye and brain injury. He was succeeded by his young son Francis. The country was in the midst of religious conflict between Catholics, Huguenots and Calvinists and the uncertainties of a 15-year-old king were the last thing that the country needed. Catherine acted as regent and many felt that they saw far too much of her Italian Catholic hand in the rule of her teenage son. She took the blame for many of the country's problems. After a 17-month rule, the young king died of natural but uncertain causes and was succeeded by Catherine's second son, Charles. 
Religious tensions continued until all-out war between Catholics and Protestants broke out in 1562, after the killing of Huguenot worshippers by troops under the king's command. There were several attempts at a peace settlement, until in 1572 the king ordered his sister Margaret to marry a leading Protestant who was in the royal line of succession, Henry of Navarre. It was while leading Huguenots were gathered for this wedding that Henry realised his attempt at appeasement had failed to impress the people, and under Catherine's influence he allowed the Huguenots to be rounded up and killed in what was to become known as the St Bartholomew's Day Massacre. These events had their own cultural resonances, as Huguenots fled from France, many ending up in England, where Christopher Marlowe heard of the events and penned the play The Massacre at Paris in 1593. But more of that another time, for the moment, back to Catherine's sons. Charles died of tuberculosis in 1574 and was succeeded by his brother Henry. He ruled until his murder in 1589 by a Catholic extremist. Catherine had died at the beginning of that year, influential to the end, but her third son also died without issue, so the direct line ended and the throne passed to Henry of Navarre, first of the Bourbon monarchs. That is a very brief view of a complex bit of French history, but the important thing to note is that all the kings that are mentioned in the following are either Catherine de' Medici's husband or one of her three sons. She was always there in the background throughout the period. Aside from all that politics, Catherine's court was a hub of artistic entertainment that blended French and Italian styles. She was a foreigner, so no doubt part of the intention was to win over courtiers and visitors to her camp through art and culture. But whatever the reasons, the result were lavish galas full of singing and dancing. For all the problems of the country, Catherine and her sons ensured that there were always funds available for these extravagances. Theatre also benefited from the flow-down of artistic influence from the court, but in a limited way. There was only one licensed public playhouse for theatrical presentations in Paris, the Hotel de Bourgogne, which you might remember I mentioned in the first episode of this season as part of the transition from the medieval period. The theatre was the home of the Confraternity of the Passion, a group of amateur actors drawn from local merchants and craft guilds who had been producing cycle plays under royal warrant since 1402. Church influence then curtailed their early successes, and after a long history that I summarised in episode 64, out of necessity in 1548, the association was forced to move its location from their prime position to the second arrondissement of the city. They were still optimistic enough to build the new theatre, the Hotel de Bourgogne, as their home, but soon after they were forbidden from performing religious plays, so the association performed a reduced repertoire and the new theatre was often leased to travelling troops of Italian acrobats, but not to the travelling French players. With censorship coming from Calvinists and other religious, and constant criticism of the expenses lavished at court coming from the French Parliament, which the royal family managed to more or less ignore, there was little incentive for entrepreneurs to establish more theatres in Paris, and significantly, there was no playwright of truly outstanding quality working at the time, so theatre lacked the drive on all sides that we see across the English Channel at about the same time. Librarian to the royal household of Henry II, Malin de saint galais managed to please the king with his translation of Tresino's tragedy in the classical mode from 1515, Sephonisa. He took the Italian verse and translated it into French prose, But unfortunately for him, the Royal Gala performance was not given until 1559, by which time he'd been dead for a year. The Royal Chateau at Blois was the venue, with the King's daughters and the visiting Mary Stuart, then betrothed to the Dauphin, taking the leading roles. The King's delight at the play may have had more to do with his family connection to the performers than his appreciation of a French version of a Senecan tragedy. We'll never know that for sure. In any event, this was very much still courtly theatre, much like the type that we've seen in the various Italian courts further south. The beginnings of a French secular theatre for the time again comes from the schoolroom and the study of Terence, Plautus and Seneca. In Jesuit schools, plays based on Bible stories were performed, but following the line of a Senecan tragedy rather than a medieval mystery play. Other Greek and Roman sources were studied and Aristotle's unities were accepted as the basis for all good drama. 
Mystery plays were banned in 1546 and theatrical activity in its entirety was in the hands of some of the elites at court, travelling players and students giving readings of adapted Latin classics. It's from this last group that a playwright emerges who was to leave a significant mark on French theatre despite his relatively small theatrical output. Etienne Jodel, born in Paris in 1532 to a family in the minor nobility, had expected to enter the military when he finished his studies. But he became distracted by the ancient literature he was studying and joined a group of like-minded contemporaries who had become influenced by the poet Joachim de Belay and the ideas he promoted. He espoused incorporating Greek and Latin into everyday French and the need to create a new French theatre that rediscovered, in his words, the dignity of Greek and Roman theatre. Following that idea, Jodel took Plutarch's account of the love affair between Mark Antony and Cleopatra and created Captive Cleopatra in 1552. Using many ancient Greek ideas and motifs, Jodel opened his play with the ghost of Mark Antony as an augury of doom, predicting many problems for those he had left behind in the mortal realm. The victorious Octavian and Agrippa speak of the glory of Rome and its treasures, and Cleopatra complains of their harsh treatment of her, a description that also leads the ghost of Mark Antony to curse the victorious Romans. The play ends with a chorus of Egyptian women announcing the suicide of Cleopatra. In an amateur performance, with the author taking the role of Cleopatra, the play was performed for King Henry, who was impressed enough to make a gift of a payment to the players and to see the play again when it was presented a second time in a courtyard at the university in Paris. Accounts describe how every window bordering the courtyard were crammed with people trying to see the play, which was said to be a rare and beautiful thing full of novelty. In the enthusiasm of the moment, Jodel was hailed as the new Sophocles, but that was certainly too generous and speaks more to the paucity of theatre available at the time than to Jodel's skills as a playwright. The dialogue that dominates the play only has moments of good poetry and the action is very static. It's likely that what impressed his audience, besides the presence of the king and the royal entourage, was the set, the costumes, and perhaps, for those who could appreciate such things, the clever use of the ghost to enable the unity of time and place to be maintained. Jodel then turned to comedy with Eugene or The Meeting in 1552. This was a commentary on modern French life that centred on the activities of a free-thinking and free-living abbé. It too received a royal performance and was well received at court. It was then repeated at the university to an equally good reception. But the church, who had some obvious objections to the portrayal of the central cleric in the story, who displayed a bit too much joie de vivre, took a different view and were vocal in their condemnation of the piece. Jodel and his group ignored the criticism and were overjoyed with his continued success. They held a dynastic feast in Paris to celebrate his genius. The young playwright was garlanded with laurels and presented with a goat to recall the winner of the city Dionysia in ancient Athens. The celebrations backfired badly when they were characterised as pagan rites by profligate students and condemned by the church. Jodel found himself distanced from those who had lauded him just a few months before and his third play received barely any attention at all. Done with the theatre, he eked out a living writing poetry refusing offers to write for the stage again, even when he was in dire financial straits. He died in poverty, aged just 40. Jodel followed principles that were to become the established norms of the French theatre for decades to come. That tragedy should adhere to Aristotelian unities. That dialogue should be poetic. And that heroic figures should rise above the -the run-of-the-mill life were the elements that he and his fellow artists espoused and maintained in their work and that were taken on board by French dramatists wholeheartedly. Jodel's near-contemporary, Jean de la Taille, continued in the same vein. His Saul Enraged, from 1565, took a biblical story and gave it a Senecan treatment. He tried his best to adhere to the unity of place, but he only achieved it by placing sets of three different locations very closely together on a platform stage. Aristotle would have called that cheating for sure. But despite that, de la Taille was a strong supporter of the Aristotelian model for theatre and, like many in the age, believed that theatre should aim to show only the heroic, the best of mankind, which for him equated to the high-born, 
as only they were capable of being heroic on the scale required. He also wrote comedies and some pastoral pieces where lowly characters, shepherds and shepherdesses and the like, were part of the idyll of the countryside that was almost as far away from the reality of rural living as one could get, but nevertheless gave the court and university students diversion that they appreciated. Lazare de Beff, the king's ambassador to the Venetian Republic, produced French verse translations of Hecuba and Electra, but it was his son, Jean-Antoine, who was to have a more significant influence on French theatre. As well as an interest in theatre that ran along the same lines as Jodel and de la Taille, he was a great lover of music. The concerts he sponsored became so well regarded that the king gave him permission to set up a formal musical academy in Paris. While engaged on this project, he became concerned that the theatre was straying too far from the Greek Aristotelian model, so he wrote La Brave, the Brave, in 1567, ensuring that it stayed well within these classical limitations. His concern for the purity of the form seems to have grown up when some playwrights in the orbit of his group and of the court were becoming semi-professional. As they began to earn income from their plays, they began to stretch the form as they tried to discover what was popular with an audience. They were tempted to push the classical boundaries, but Jean Antoine was of a more intellectual mould and disliked the changes he thought he was seeing. The king, at this point Charles IX, Catherine's second son, was on the throne and saw the play and was said to think highly of the piece. But in general, his taste tended towards lighter entertainments, the pastoral and the comic, rather than the serious and the tragic. Of all these academic and rather literary contributions, those by Robert Garnier were perhaps the most significant and influential. Born in 1544, he studied law and rose quickly through the judicial ranks, being admitted to the bar in Paris in 1566, about the same time that his literary efforts also became recognised. That recognition was in the form of reciting a short pastoral poem he had written to King Charles IX when he visited Toulouse. In the next 15 years, he wrote eight stage tragedies, one of which is often considered a tragicomedy, the first in French. He probably never saw professional productions of any of his plays in his lifetime, but all were published and were popular when read in the salons and the universities. So it seems reasonable to assume that there were amateur productions at the time. There was even an English translation of the plays published before his death in 1590. He was most admired by his contemporaries for the poetry in his plays, which covered the usual suspects of Greek myth, biblical story and, in one case, Italian poetry when he penned a version of Ariosto's Orlando Furioso. This is the piece that is more tragicomic, as Garnier abandoned the Senecan model that he'd used in his previous plays, and adapted Ariosto's original considerably, so that it became something French rather than Italian. His adaptation was written in 1581, and called Bradamante. She is the daughter of parents with high hopes for her elevation in society. As a warrior maiden, she is much admired, and her father negotiates her engagement to Leon, heir to the Byzantine Empire. But she has fallen for Roger, Leon's friend, and rejects her father's choice. He takes an appeal to King Charlemagne to mediate the situation, and he decrees that as Badamente is a warrior, she should settle the matter in a one-to-one combat with Leon's champion. While travelling to the court, Roger is attacked by bandits and rescued by Leon, who doesn't recognise him as he's wearing borrowed armour. Leon demands that, as his reward, Roger becomes his champion. Roger agrees, but when they arrive at Charlemagne's court, he's forced to reveal his identity. In the face of their true friendship, Leon accepts that he cannot marry Bradamante, and is gifted Charlemagne's daughter instead. The king then makes Roger king of Bulgaria, making his match with Bradamante acceptable to her parents. Now summarised briefly like this, it's difficult to see what appealed at the time. The story was a well-known one, part of the Roland romance popular in France and particularly in the south where Garnier came from, even if in this case the inspiration came via Ariosto's Italian. The story of the female Christian warrior was certainly part of the attraction. She'd always been part of the Roland romance and something of a mythical figure. The poetry is rightly admired, but the resolution is weak even by the standards of the Roman final reveal scene that it's based on. The action is once again extremely static. 
With historical distance, what makes this and much of Garnier's work interesting is that we can see the influence of the Italian Renaissance playwrights on the work and his influence on playwrights who come after him. Once works had made their way into French from the Italian in print versions, and in his case were translated into English, they became more accessible to English playwrights, who were looking to the continent for inspiration. Just as an example for now, as we'll get to the English playwrights of the Renaissance and beyond in lots of detail in the future, we can see Garnier's influence on Thomas Kidd. Kidd was born in 1558 and is best known for his early play The Spanish Tragedy. But his other works include translations of plays from French, one of which was Garnier's Corneille. Scholars have seen inspiration from that play in lines in The Spanish Tragedy and another Kidd original play, Arden of Faversham. These uses can be traced to a 1585 edition of Garnier's plays that Kidd would have had access to. And this is no criticism of Kidd. He was a prolific borrower of ideas and phrases and even direct quotations from other plays, as were his contemporaries to one degree or another. As I've mentioned before, with no meaningful understanding of copyright as we would know it, free use of existing works was generally seen throughout the Renaissance as a compliment rather than a problem and an extension of the immense amount of collaboration that took place between playwrights. In Kidd's case, he didn't copy the French directly, but the parallels in some passages are so close, it's difficult to think that he'd not seen the printed edition of Bradamante. As an example, here is a passage from Kidd's Soliman and Persida. Sooth to say, the earth is my country as the sire to the fowl, or the marine moisture to the red gilled fish. Each place is my habitation. Therefore, each country's word is mine to pronounce, and where a man lies well, there is his country. Now I'm not going to try and make my way through the corresponding Old French from Bradamente, but both passages are based on the same Latin proverb, wherever we are content, that is our country, and use the same pairs of figures, airs and birds, fish and sea, the world and the country. The passage has no equivalent in Kidd's primary source material, which is a translation by Henry Wooten of a story by a French author, Jacques Yves, who was a near contemporary. So it seems he liked the sound or the tone or the imagery of this particular passage of Garnier's and inserted it in its spirit, if not word for word, into his own work. Patterns of cross-influence like this from Italian to French and English crisscross their way through the period and beyond. For what was to be his final play, Garnier turned to the Old Testament and gave the story of the revolt of King Zedekiah of Judah against Nebuchadnezzar the Senecan treatment. The Jewish king and his court are holed up in Jerusalem after their revolt has failed, and Amital, the queen mother, has to plead for her son's life, which Nebuchadnezzar grants, but at the expense of holding her grandchildren hostage. When the women hear that the hostages have been called out, they fear the worst, and soon learn that Nebuchadnezzar has broken his word, killed the hostages, and blinded her son. So begins the Babylonian exile. But the play ends with the chorus who have told much of the narrative, looking forward with hope to the coming of the Messiah. On this occasion, the king found the play not to his liking far too serious for the court looking for entertainment and escapism. And Garnier, an ardent royalist, was so disheartened that he retired from the theatre and never wrote again. When he died, aged just 56, his passing was lamented, with one contemporary saying that it was agreed on all sides that he had eclipsed his predecessors. Even soon after his death, it was recognised that he had progressed theatre in France, moved it away from the Italian and given something that not only conformed to those all-important classical models and delivered some good and on occasion very fine poetry, but innovated in a new direction, such as the focus on the female characters in a sympathetic way. The admiration that was felt for his work is evident from the translations and many quotations that followed for years to come. The existence of just one public theatre in Paris remained a problem for the development of truly popular professional theatre in France. Acting troops had formed in other cities in France, but access to the premier spot in the capital, with its close proximity to the court, was jealously guarded by the confraternity of the Passion, who closely guarded their exclusive rights to theatrical performance in the city. A troop from Bordeaux tried to play in a hall in the city, but were ordered to dismantle their stage with the threat of a fine and jail, 
and were forced to comply before they had a chance to perform. The main problem was that the power of the clergy, both Catholic and Protestant, was still directed against theatre, which was seen by them as a hotbed of salacious activity and inappropriate mixing of people. And although the complete ban that they would have liked was never put in place, they were only too happy to help the confraternity when they objected to other players entering the city. But this wasn't to say that there wasn't a thirst for theatre from the citizens of the city. The theatre at the Hotel de Bourgogne, constructed at the end of the medieval period, was small compared to the Renaissance Italian and English playhouses, but the only place for theatre lovers to go. There is no surviving plan of the interior of the theatre, so there are many assumptions about its size, but a capacity of up to about 1,500 people is the best guess. That's maybe half the size of the great English playhouses. Plays were advertised by notices stuck to walls and fences around the city that named the play to be presented and the timing of the performances. These were irregular, maybe two or three times in a week. The theatre was usually opened at one o'clock, maybe earlier in the winter, and the play commenced about an hour later. An audience who knew it could walk home before dark was a happy one. Paris had no civil police force and was notorious for casual criminality at the time and few felt safe to be out once the sun had set. The stage was deep, maybe 25 feet wide, and raised 5 to 6 feet from the viewing floor. There was no seating except for small private boxes close to the stage, and perhaps a gallery at the back. Most spectators stood on the floor that was covered with rushes. In this period, a curtain hung from the back of the stage, but otherwise we don't have any details of any decoration from the early Renaissance. Later, from the mid-1600s, there are invoices for work by scenic painters at the theatre, so it seems that by then painted backdrops were being used to suggest location. Lighting was certainly dim, coming only from oil lamps, and the atmosphere in a full house must have been stuffy at least, probably positively smelly to modern sensibilities. Pressure continued from groups wanting to perform in Paris. Fairs that lasted for several days were held regularly just outside the city, and on one occasion in 1599 a group of players set up a stage. The confraternity immediately lodged a complaint, and the troupe were stopped from giving further performances, even though, as the performance was outside the city, it was technically allowed under the law. When the confraternity were at the theatre for their next performance, they were heckled by the crowd in support of the players. It seems that the protests turned into a near riot that frightened the city leaders, who immediately ruled that any disturbance at the theatre could be legally punished, but also allowed performances at the fair to resume, on payment of a fee to the confraternity. This still didn't satisfy them, and they appealed to the king not only to confirm their monopoly on theatrical performances in the city, but to allow them to resume performance of mystery plays. The king agreed, but when the question came to the French Parliament for ratification, it was in belligerent mood, and while agreeing that theatrical space should not be leased to anyone but the confraternity within the city, they should only be permitted to perform secular plays of an inoffensive nature. The king accepted this. He was, after all, a not very observant Huguenot, so it was not really a great issue for him either way. And it seems the status quo had been more or less maintained. But that same year, a troupe ignored the edict and performed at the Saint-Germain Fair, just again just outside the city. They paid their fee to the confraternity and no further action was taken. So they moved to a site in the city, the Hotel d'Argent. Again they paid their fee and again there was no reaction from the confraternity. A second Parisian theatre had been established. The troupe was run by Matthew Lefebvre and his wife Marie Vernier. The name of the theatre was soon changed to the Théâtre de Marais and Marie is now recognised as the first professional actress of the Parisian stage. The French Renaissance was a relatively short period, starting properly in the mid-1500s and lasting for just a hundred years or so. For many, it's little more than a transition period that starts with the abrupt end of the medieval period and concludes with the start of the early Baroque and neoclassical period, which for France was a particular artistic high point. The medieval plays in France were some of the best developed and most sophisticated presentations of their age, so we might say that they were better placed for change than was the case in many other countries. 
the influence of Catherine Medici played its part in promoting a new cultural life in France, as did her pleasure-loving husband and sons, who were always ready to promote artistic endeavour. The gap between the haves and the have-nots in French society was enormous at this time, and we can see, even in the 1500s, the disparities that were eventually to lead France into some very dark times indeed. Next time, I'll continue the story of the French Renaissance theatre with a look at what was happening in the country outside of the capital and how the later stages of theatre in the French Renaissance developed. In the meantime, you can join the Facebook group or page to keep up with what's happening on the podcast. And if you feel like helping me out further, please spread the word about the podcast to anyone who you think might be interested. If you'd like to show me your appreciation in a practical way, then please take a look at the offering on Patreon. That's at www.patreon.com slash T-H-O-E-T-P. It's just me doing it here, so any help or comments are really appreciated. Thanks everyone for your continued support, and I look forward to your company next time. But if you have any comments or concerns in the meantime, you can contact me by email at T-H-O-E-T-P at gmail.com or via Twitter at T-H-O-E-T-P. Thank you.